Um, we will now talk about how can we ensure the sustainable development of northern and Arctic resources um, and in this one hour session. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, in uh, this uh, one hour session, we will have four panelists uh, that I will be very proud to present to you in a few seconds. But now, just a little introduction on our session and also a little word about the interpreters that uh, will uh, provide the, the translation service for those of you that have uh, that need because some part of the uh, interviews and ex um, discussion will be in French and others in English, so we will switch to both languages. Um, so this afternoon we will talk about the global interest of economic development on the, of the northern and Arctic regions um, has been growing rapidly. Uh, this has been driven by both supply and demand shifts for the resources and amenities produced in those uh, two regions. On the coast side, there is a perception that climate change uh, driven impacts in the Arctic will reduce ice cover in this area and therefore also impact cost and doing business. Uh, simultaneously, global demand to these unique marine Arctic resources is increasing as both population and wealth increase. So now I will introduce uh, my four panelists and sorry for those of you that don't know me uh, um, already. I'm Noemi Gigard, the Executive Di Director of Technopole Marti Maritime du Québec. Um, which is an organization uh, make, making links between research and uh, businesses. And I'm really proud to introduce you to um, Simon Barnabé. Uh, Simon is an industrial microbiologist with master's and PhD degree in water science from INRS in Quebec, Canada. He is actually a professor at University du Québec at Trois-Rivières in Quebec, Canada also where he holds an industrial research chair in environment and biotechnology and the industrial research ch chair in regional, regional bioeconomy um, and bioenergy. Is it? it it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we also have, uh, just a side of him, uh, Yves de La Fontaine, um, who is Regional Director of Science and Director of Maurice Lamontagne Institute uh, in Quebec Region Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, um, Yves uh, has uh, over 30 years of experience in scientific research and management. Um, between uh, 2011 and 2013, he acted as di Director of Division of Research and Protection of Aquatic Ecosystems at Center, uh, Centre Saint-Laurent uh, d'Environnement Canada in Montreal. And since April, April 2014, he is the Regional Director of Science and Director of the Maurice Lamontagne Institute at DFO. So nice to, uh, to welcome you, uh, Yves. And um, Elisabeth Varen. Uh, Elisabeth uh, has a PhD in marine biotechnology at the uh, University du Québec at Rimouski, and she is specialized on mussel aquaculture. At the end of her PhD in 2016, she decided with her partners to create Sibiosis, a company. Uh, pioneer Caspasian company in offshore seaweed farming and uh, in transformation, transformation into original food product. So welcome, Elizabeth. And finally, uh, Paul Thomas Lacroix, uh, Quebec Regional Director of Natural Products Canada. Uh, Paul Thomas brings deep experience in international market development and investment analysis within the global marine biomass innovation space. Uh, he is now Quebec Provincial Director of, as I said, Natural Products Canada, uh, a center of excellence for commercialization and research of the federal government of Canada. So 
let's go with some interaction. But before I would just, I would like to ask you to present yourself just a little bit. Just how are you uh, different from the other panelists, or what do you bring to the table as with your expertise to just uh, begin this panel? So, do you want to try something? Of course. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Paul Thomas. I'm regional director for the province of Quebec of Natural Products Canada. We are a center of excellence uh, for commercialization and research. I'm based at INAF in Quebec City, which is the founding uh, partner of Natural Products Canada. So we have a national mission, and our mission is to accelerate the process of bringing innovation to market. Uh, you guys have been hearing a lot about uh, the Dead Valley gap Uh, after the products is ready to go to market. Well, we're, we're, we're there to fill that gap and we're there to help companies and research centers have more commercial success. So, uh, you know, look at me as the, uh, uh, about uh, how we're differentiating to each other, but look at me as the, uh, you know, commercialization person, if I can say, but with, with, uh, with the relation with the research, obviously. So uh, we have, a, we have a, a, an investment fund within the, uh, the different tools that we have to help the ecosystem. Uh, and so we, uh, we collaborate with other uh, VCs or investment funds to, uh, to make it happen, basically. So uh, I'll turn it over to my, to my colleague. Allô? Oui. Donc, euh, moi, c'est Elisabeth Varenne, c'est ça. Euh, j'ai, euh, je suis venue de France au Canada pour faire mes études. Euh, puis, après euh, mon doctorat, j'ai voulu me lancer dans l'aventure de euh, l'entrepreneuriat. Euh, et pour ça, euh, nous avons choisi de nous installer en Gaspésie pour faire de l'aquaculture d'algues, puis les transformer en produits alimentaires. Euh, et on met en fait l'innovation euh, vraiment en avant dans notre entreprise à nos débuts, euh, parce que c'est un nouveau domaine, très peu est connu au Québec, très peu est fait. Euh, donc moi, je pense que à ce panel, je vais apporter l'aspect de, d'une entreprise, de, des réalités euh, que c'est de vivre dans une région nordique, même si c'est dans la baie des Chaleurs, mais ça reste une région nordique. On a de la glace euh, l'hiver, etc. Donc euh, je pense que c'est mon, mon apport à ce panel. Oui, bonjour. Uh, mon nom est Yves de La Fontaine. I'm the um, Regional Director of Science for Fisheries and Ocean. For those of you who don't know Fisheries and Ocean, it's the, uh, the main department uh, in charge of research and development in marine systems and, and ocean in Canada. So what I do bring here, uh, I think it's the research and monitoring component. Uh, DFO, Fisheries and Ocean, is dedicated to ensure sustainability of aquatic resources. So we're a bit... Uh, upstream of, of probably most of your interest, ensure that the resource is there, is healthy and abundant for future generations. So that's, that's the first, I would say, major goal of fisheries and ocean. The other one is we all recognize that exploitation is the main objective of, uh, of exploiting the resource, so we have to make sure that the sustainability of the exploitation is there. So we're, we're there to back up the industry to make sure that They won't collapse in a, in a few years if they start developing something new. And finally, uh, we're there as well to ensure security at sea. So we have a major safety program to make sure that when we do exploit the, the ocean and marine systems, that we do it safely for the, uh, the human beings. Um, regionally speaking, I invite you tomorrow. We have the Discovery Day. So if you wish to see IML and the, the, our institute, it's about 30 minutes downstream. So uh, you're all welcome tomorrow. Thanks. So hi everybody, my name is Simon Bernabé. Yes, I am the professor here, so you will hear uh, about uh, speaking about education and training, of course. But you know, uh, we have, uh, my team is distinguished it, uh, itself from other teams by the, we have a very um, particular regional approach when we are making research. When we have a partner, we are trying to create a lot of synergy around it. So we are making some kind of regional uh, research. And at that case, I would want to bring my experience with the lower North Shore of Quebec, where actually we are very active. 
we brought you some people from the Lorraine Orchard uh, at this event and uh, many other teams around that. Not only university team, but we are, are uh, we have, we have um, a close relation with the, co the, the college team, you know, the, the, trans uh, the Technological Transfer College Center called Merinov, which is important to be, if you have, if you have, you know, a project here in the north uh, of Quebec, uh, I advise you really to uh, involve them. So I am here to bring up this, uh, this experience. Thank you, thank you. So just to begin it, um, our big theme, because we have just working together on that panel and then split it in some teams. So the first theme is what for you in the Northern and Arctic regions, what are the key sectors and the key resources Um, so, uh, en français, peut-être, quels sont uh, pour vous les secteurs uh, clés et les ressources clés uh, pour le, le développement des régions uh, arctiques et nordiques? Le premier, <laughs> un volontaire. <laughs> um, well, I think, uh, uh, bon, on va y aller en français. Uh, Euh, C'est sûr que là, on parle d'Arctique, on parle de, de ressources nordiques également. Euh, euh, tout ça inclut beaucoup de, de sous-questions, beaucoup d'opportunités de sujets, mais euh, je pense qu'il euh, faut penser aussi au volume de la ressource disponible. Euh, C'est sûr, nous ici, dans, je pense d'un point de vue aussi régional, euh, on a, on a le, le crabe des neiges qui est, qui est reconnu comme une ressource où euh, il y a un volume très intéressant. Euh, C'est une industrie qui est, qui est très bien établie aussi. Il y a une volonté des industriels à, 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 à je pense, développer des coproduits puis valoriser ces, cette ressource-là. Donc, euh, pour amener un élément concret sur la table, moi, je dirais que le crabe des neiges est une ressource clé à valoriser dans l'avenir. Euh, il y a beaucoup de volonté aussi de, de structures internationales qui demandent de l'intérêt, euh, si je peux dire, en une certaine mesure, à à travailler sur, sur ce sujet-là. Euh, étant basé à l'INAF, moi, c'est sûr que j'ai des, des, des échos de, de, de personnes impliquées dans le domaine, notamment Lucie Brouilleux, qui, qui travaille beaucoup dans les, dans les produits marins. Et donc, euh, c'est un petit peu pour toutes ces, toutes ces raisons-là que j'évoque cette, euh, cette, cette espèce-là en particulier. Euh, et puis, euh, les crevettes nordiques aussi. Puis là, c'est sûr, j'apprends rien à personne, mais peut-être le, le message que je veux dire, c'est essayons de nous concentrer sur certains... Euh, certaines ressources clés, puis d'aligner les ressources, le capital, euh, sur, euh, sur certains créneaux spécifiques pour que tout le monde pu, pousse dans la même direction. Donc, euh, crevette nordique aussi, bien reconnue. Euh, euh, je discutais justement avec euh, une consultante, Lilia, euh, qui est basée euh, en Islande et puis qui, qui parlait justement de la crevette nordique, à quel point c'est une des ressources la plus pure euh, dans l'écosystème. Et puis de là, on peut, on peut parler beaucoup d'opportunités de, de marketing associé à, à la pureté des ressources. Euh, je prends par exemple le créneau d'excellence agro-boréal qui est dans le nord du Québec. Et eux ont, ont, été, ont fait un bon travail. Je pense qu'ils ont développé un branding associé aux ressources nordiques. Donc, les produits, les ingrédients qui sont vendus euh, issus des régions nordiques ont une certification agro-boréal. Et euh, ben, on pourrait voir aussi euh, des, des éléments de ce type-là dans les ingrédients marins qui proviennent de régions arctiques, nordiques. Comme, euh, comme symbole de pureté. Euh, et, et, et ça, je pense qu'on on a des, des exemples à succès dans d'autres secteurs qui peuvent, être, euh, qui peuvent être amenés dans le secteur marin. Et donc, euh, euh, rapidement, c'est un petit peu mes, 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 mes sujets d'entrée en, de jeu. Là. Euh, je vais rebondir un peu sur euh, ce que tu viens de dire. En effet, euh, la pureté des, des côtes euh, euh, dans les régions nordiques et Arctique euh, sont vraiment incroyables, puis euh, c'est facile de, de montrer ça au niveau mondial. Euh, puis moi, je rebondis sur les algues, en effet, mais euh, y a une, euh, y a, les ressources sont abondantes, je pense, puis il euh, y a une variété d'algues qui existent, qui sont dans un milieu, euh, on n'a rien à ajouter dans le milieu, tout est là, puis euh, l'aquaculture d'algues est quelque chose de relativement facile à faire. Il n'y a pas d'intrants, il n'y a, a aucune manipulation euh, à outrance à faire. Puis on peut euh, proposer des produits euh, purs 
qui font même envie à de nombreux autres pays. Mm -hmm. euh, donc, euh, ce sont des ressources à exploiter et euh, notamment pas uniquement l'aquaculture, mais il y a beaucoup d'espèces d'algues. Euh, par contre, dans les régions nordiques et arctiques, je pense qu'on n'en connaît pas encore beaucoup. Euh, je le sais pour les algues, la biomasse des algues, les, les, les biomasses pour chaque espèce d'algues. Euh, je pense que euh, Pêche Océan peut, euh, peut appuyer là-dessus en disant qu'il y a encore beaucoup à connaître avant de, de trop aller exploiter euh, sans le savoir. Parfait, merci. Si nous parlons de ce que je would appeler l'Arctique canadien, c'est une zone plus large. C'est plus de 4 millions de square kilomètres. Donc, je veux dire, c'est tremendously large. Difficile à accéder, ce qui est un grand défi. Et si vous had to remove all the the ice, you would discover over 36,000 islands. So it's a, probably one of the largest ar 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 archipel, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> archipelago. Uh, so it's something that, it's, it's a brand new type of ecosystem. I mean, it's not something that we're used to, uh, to work with. Uh, it's going to provide a lot of challenge, but also a lot of opportunities. Can you imagine having the coastline <laughs> around those 36,000 islands? Um, at the moment, we consider we don't even know half of what's on there because the ice cover, uh, we consider from science perspective that we don't know probably half of the surface area. So there's a lot of things that still needs to be discovered, I'd say, that are presently unknown. So in terms of opportunities, uh, yeah, uh, seaweed and, and crabs are, are probably those, but I'm just thinking of what we'll discover uh, in the future. Yes, but, but you know, there's no, there not only marine resources there, there's also, also other resources like wild berries, mushroom, things like this. You know, with all the change that, that we will see in the future, probably that the Nordic agriculture will raise, so we, we will have to make some mix between all of this sector. I think it would be very important to consider that. Also, we were, uh, my colleague here we was speaking about we have still to discover things. Keep in mind that in each of these regions, there's always elders, people that know all the secrets of the region. If you can get their secrets, you can get the opportunities. Keep that in mind. Good, good point. Thank you. Yes, for sure, we have to work with the, the community and the knowledge and then to, uh, to expand the... Uh, Uh, who better uh, ensure the sustainability of development of those, those northern, because we are in the northern region, but we talk about going north and north as uh, there is climate changing and climate changes. So it, can, it allows me to switch on that subject now. Um, what are the changes and the challenges that you see uh, that are coming for the northern and the uh, Arctic regions, do you, do you as a different expert or you, Elizabeth, as a business um, woman, do you see some changes or challenges coming from the, the, the climate change? Um, well, um, first of all, we have seen uh, benefits because uh, Sibiosis is in a place where uh, it would have been not possible to do uh, seaweed culture uh, because of the ice uh, cover, but now the ice cover is thinner and thinner, so we can do uh, aquaculture. But uh, we don't know yet how uh, the climate changes will impact on the seaweed. For example, we have an invasive species, which is Briozoaire, bri and probably the warmer temperature will um, uh, bring more Briozoaire and earlier in time. So uh, there are numerous issues that we need to address. Uh, but for now, it's kind of a good thing. <laughs> But uh, we really have to work with the research centers, and even as a company, we need to, uh, to, uh, to monitor the changes every year. And I think we are in the first place to see the changes because we know the yields every year and all. And that's why we're working a lot with the research centers for that. Great. Thank you. I think uh, the question is, you know, about northern regions. Uh, 
I think uh, one of the keys is uh, highly skilled uh, personnel that we can uh, that we can bring in those regions, and uh, to have the, some knowledge transfer, and uh, and we have to have the communities involved, uh, you know, at the base of the ecosystem, uh, and we need to bring also mentors into the ecosystem, you know, networks of mentors to eventually um, have a, a channel to market again with all those innovations. So. Uh, for me, I think it is, is really bringing some knowledge uh, into the region, um, helping the communities get involved and getting the infrastructures. This is really touching an economic development uh, kind of aspect, but uh, uh, I think they have uh, uh, interesting opportunities that are arising uh, because of climate changes. We have uh, a shift in the distribution of fish of, uh, of plankton, for example. This is really kind of changing the game of wh which kind of fish will be uh, exploitable uh, over the next uh, 10 or 20 years. Um, and maybe Eve will correct me on that, but uh, I think this is an opportunity for northern regions to, uh, to, uh, to grab. But, but this won't happen if we were not able to, let's say, establish a satellite R&D office in one of these northern regions. Uh, to have a you know a, a recurrent uh, knowledge transfer activity, and, uh, and for me that that's that that's the key of the development of those regions. Uh, I would tend to say yeah, I agree. I think uh, the approach probably will need to be different. I think if we if we wish to develop the Arctic with the I would say the southern uh, façon de faire, uh, we may be wrong. I think. It's pretty costly to go up in the Arctic, and, to, and there's no easy way to access. So we're going to rely either on planes or, or navigation, mar, mar, uh, marine transport. So there's probably a huge need to develop locally. And uh, it would be very, very, I would say, non-beneficial to simply exploit and export. Uh, so working with the local communities, trying to develop and, and ensure that they have locally an input into the production of, of byproducts and products. So exporting byproducts instead of exporting raw material would probably be something uh, that we should not forget. Yes, I can add to the, what I can add to that is about the business seasonality, you know, the season of the business. It will clearly, clearly uh, increase because, by example, the ice-free season will increase. So it means more fishing, it means, it means probably more biomass to process, so the, 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 the industry will have to change, will have to acquire new technology, uh, adapt to the new species, uh, making modification to their existing uh, the technique of harvesting, so I think that's, that's one of the major changes that, uh, we're, that the in challenge that we have at the, that place. Yes. Maybe just a last point about northern regions. Uh, um, uh, I think for companies, they have to um, see the northern region's development as a very interesting opportunity to gain a competitive advantage, to have to set up shop over there. Uh, you know, the ecosystem is, is will probably only <laughs> structure itself to, to welcome one, uh, uh, one new organization to, to collaborate if there is a, an extraction facility of some kind in, in some, some northern regions. Uh, and the ecosystem is allowing this to happen, I guarantee you that there, were, there will not be a second one because the resources uh, will be probably fully uh, directed to this, to this company and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the local communities will work at this, at this, uh, at this new place and uh, so th this creates a, a great competitive advantage for a private company to establish itself in the northern regions for all these reasons and uh, uh, companies need, need to look at that as, as, uh, as a key differentiating uh, aspect on that. One, one thing we should not forget, or we, we, we see the, the, the future, the ice cover removal and so on, has an opening to, to the Arctic. And, and those models exist that species will move northward and we can take advantage of them. But obviously in the southern part, we're losing stuff. And, and for example, one of the basic observation we've been seeing in terms of climate change effect up in the north and in the south is, for example, Gulf of St. Lawrence. The Gulf of St. Lawrence used to be ice covered uh, four or five months a year. Uh, basically, these days, we're talking not even a month sometimes. 
So one of the main impact we've seen is the loss of the harp seals. We used to have over hundreds of thousands of harp seals. Now we count them in terms of not even 10 thousands. So what will be the impact on the overall harp seals population? Because the harp seal is migrating between the north in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the winter and the summer. So those kind of questions, this is where, for example, fishes in the ocean, it's, it's a real concern for us. Because if we want to ensure, for example, uh, sustainability of harp seals harvesting, well, we have a, a major gap of information at the moment. What's going to happen? It's one example. So it, it's nice to see that, oh yeah, we're going to open up new area, but there's a probably at the expense of something else. Je pense que je vais rebondir sur ça, sur cette euh, question des données euh, qui sont peut-être manquantes ou sur euh, justement l'ouverture de ces nouveaux territoires-là avec, on a mentionné des, euh, des défis, mais déjà aussi quelques occasions ou opportunités qui viennent euh, autant, il euh, y, y a des limitations, il y a des avantages. Mais euh, l'idée des données sur ces territoires-là, on a déjà les territoires nordiques qu'on connaît, je pense qu'on ne les connaît pas tous déjà actuellement, mais là, on a de nouveaux territoires qui s'ouvrent et qui sont d'intérêt pour euh, plusieurs, je pense, pour plusieurs types d'industries. On pense au transport maritime, on parle aussi d'aquaculture au niveau de la culture des algues, mais aussi la, les pêcheries. Euh, qui, euh, qui vont en ce sens-là, les modifications au niveau de la distribution des espèces, le euh, changement climatique. Euh, quel est votre, votre avis un peu sur, je dirais, un peu l'ensemble de, euh, de, 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 la, de la thématique sur les données, la gestion de données, euh, sur les connaissances sur ce territoire-là en fonction de vos différentes euh, spécialités? Peut-être un point de vue. Peut-être, en fait, Elisabeth, je me tournerai encore un peu vers toi. Mais, mais comme euh, entreprise ou personne qui utilise la ressource, qu'est-ce qui pourrait être pour une entreprise qui désire euh, agrandir son, 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 sa business, euh, ses, ses opérations ou même aller voir plus vers le nord? Quels peuvent être les besoins d'en de donner pour une entreprise comme la vôtre? Euh, C'est sûr que. Comme je disais un petit peu tout à l'heure, on a vraiment besoin de connaître la ressource qu'on veut produire. Euh, puis c'est pour ça que, ça, en tant qu'entreprise, nous-mêmes, on a pris la décision rapidement de travailler avec les centres de recherche. Euh, puis d'autant plus que plus on monte vers le nord, moins on en connaît, moins c'est accessible. Euh, c'est sûr que s'installer à une place où, par exemple, il y avait déjà beaucoup d'aquaculture, bon, ben, on peut se fier un peu à ce qui se faisait déjà, mais une place où c'est très peu fait, comme les algues au Québec, par exemple, euh, on n'a vraiment pas eu le choix d'aller de, approcher, des, des, euh, ben, par exemple, Mérinov, qui a passé plusieurs années à travailler sur la culture et la cueillette des algues dans ces régions-là. Euh, puis qui eux-mêmes sont même allés travailler avec des centres de recherche étrangers qui connaissent beaucoup mieux le domaine. Euh, donc nous, on doit travailler tout le temps, il y a un échange constant, on connaît très bien les différents centres de recherche. Et aussi, euh, on a l'avantage, par exemple, euh, avec les algues, on va en mer souvent pour aller s'occuper de nos algues. Euh, et en tant qu'ancienne euh, chercheuse, je le sais à quel point ça peut être compliqué d'organiser euh, une prise de données, à, à récolter tout le, le matériel, les ressources humaines pour faire ça, quand nous-mêmes, on va sur le terrain. Donc ça arrive, par exemple, que Mérinov vienne avec nous, euh, puis qu'on joigne nos forces là-dedans. On a chacun nos spécialités, mais on y va ensemble, puis ça augmente aussi les échanges. Donc, euh, puis en plus, on, au Québec, on a la chance d'avoir des centres de recherche qui sont très accessibles, on peut leur parler. Euh, donc, nous, on trouve que c'est vraiment, euh, vraiment un beau, euh, une, une belle place pour aller se développer grâce à la recherche aussi. OK, donc il y a vraiment une, une réelle collaboration entre l'industrie oui. et les, les centres de recherche. Et grâce aussi à des biomarines, puis des conférences comme <rire> ça, ça, ça aide aussi pour, euh, pour ce genre d'échange, oui. Ah, excellent. Euh, oui, ben, la question des données est vraiment intéressante parce que, euh, puis peut-être d'un point de vue d'un de, de, fonds d'investissement ou de capital de risque, euh, une jeune entreprise comme Cibiosis, euh, qui a beaucoup de potentiel, approche des groupes pour du financement. Euh, ces groupes-là, je ne vais pas parler pour les autres, mais un des réflexes, c'est se baser sur les faits, baser sur les chiffres, ce qui est mesurable. 
Donc, c'est vraiment important pour une jeune entreprise d'avoir des données. Les données d'évolution de leurs produits, des données d'efficacité, des, des données de marché, les données sont à la base, finalement, de l'analyse financière, de l'analyse du potentiel. Quand on parle de données, on parle de prévision. Donc, un, un fonds d'investissement va toujours <rire> vouloir un, un retour sur investissement, vouloir euh, euh, finalement un résultat dans X nombre d'années. Puis, pour se projeter dans l'avenir, il va vouloir faire des prévisions, puis les prévisions vont juste être, être, euh, être basées finalement sur, sur, les, sur les données. Donc, ça, ça devient, euh, ça devient un, un, un sujet vraiment, vraiment clé pour, euh, pour euh, éventuellement s'il y a un investissement ou pas. Donc, je pense que les, les organismes locaux de marché, l'entreprise elle-même, tout ce qu'elle peut mesurer, tout ce qu'on peut récolter comme données stratégiques, ça devient vraiment le nerf de la guerre pour, euh, pour convaincre les d'autres partenaires à s'impliquer dans le projet. One other reason why we should, we really need the data is uh, it's by, it's by example to predict the change caused by the evolution of the ecosystem. You know, we want to avoid industry crashes. We want to avoid ex over exploitation. We don't want to to make what we have done with the cuts other problem that we got with the cuts. So. Uh, Surely, uh, the data management and data <laughs> access is, is something very important it, for us. Is it? Uh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe too much. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, well, you know, Canada has, has developed a new strategy to uh, provide what we call free access to data. And uh, our mandate is within a year, any data that we collect should be made available to anyone in Canada and in the world. So, therefore, for us, data access is a major uh, component of our research and monitoring activities. Um, it has changed. It was not like this in the past, but in, right now we're foreseeing uh, this sort of uh, very, very open access to data. Uh, acquiring data is another important component, especially up in the Arctic, because uh, we get, like, Uh, it was said, we're going to have to rely on local communities to help us, and we have a program called crowdsourcing, where we're going to take advantage of information provided by anyone and, and try to amalgamate that information with the scientific information that we gather and making a bulk, some large database by which we can combine both the government data with local and external data. And finally, to support that, uh, if you follow the recent investment that DFO had, we're developing very large uh, money pot for contribution, funds, uh, collaboration to ensure that data collection is part of, uh, of the process. So I think we've changed a bit our approach of uh, doing research and monitoring, especially up in the north. We definitely need help and the way we can get that help is by helping funding the, the research and monitoring up in the north. Juste pour euh, ben, rebondir un peu sur ça, euh, en fait, avant, je pense que le fait qu'on n'ait pas beaucoup de données sur les régions nordiques, c'est sûr qu'il y avait de l'accessibilité, mais il y avait aussi le fait qu'on le considérait comme pas tant exploitable que ça. Mais bizarrement, quand il y a des, des, des vues pour l'exploitation, pour les industries et tout ça, euh, ben là, il y a beaucoup plus d'aide pour aller faire des recherches là-dessus. Donc, Autant en profiter, puis justement euh, ne pas hésiter à impliquer le, la recherche, le, 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 toutes les centres scientifiques euh, euh, qui, peuvent, qui peuvent aller travailler dans les régions plus nordiques, euh, puis surtout aller dans une voie pour un développement qui soit durable, puis euh, qui soit bien fait, et non pas euh, sans connaître, euh, puis en faisant un peu n'importe quoi. Yeah. Oui Uh, Eve, I have a question for you, actually. <laughs> no, I was, I, I felt that it's so, uh, I, I see so much value in what DFO can gather as data. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how personalized can, can, can you go if you, some industry are, are going to your, uh, to your organization to have some kind of sectorial data adapted to market study or something like that. Is that something that, I know you have a national mission and that, yeah. you know, you have to focus on that, but is that something that, you had in the past or that uh, that uh, that you that you did or well the way given our mandate I mean uh, in the past for example fisheries management uh, we're doing the assessment of the the state of the resource so we're providing the information to conduct the assessment and provide some advice uh, in the past 
I mean, uh, the data were somewhat hidden. It was difficult to get access. Things have changed. I mean, we're, we're truly opening up the drawers and, and making the data more available. Um, same thing, like uh, hydrographic surveys, for example, they gather a bunch of information. But what they need to do their charts and, and uh, uh, maps and everything is, is a small fraction of the information they do gather. That information can be made available for all sorts of other potential users. Uh, so, for example, sea mapping or things. Uh, so, therefore, description of the bottom habitat, for example, well, the data are in hands of, of hydrographic services, but they don't need it per se for their need and, and purpose. But yes, they can make those available to uh, outsiders. It's a matter of exchanging, requesting, and so on. But nevertheless, it's uh, yeah, it's a new. I would say a new philosophy of trying to uh, not hide the data and, and more. Uh, but the problem we're facing is more data servers, st storage of data. That's, if you have some help, please, <laughs> we're, we're buying it. But you know, there's hope and data sharing. There's a lot of network around the yeah, world. Like not, here. Not, <laughs> not, not in the government, but at least in the research innovation. We have ArcticNet here in Canada. Yeah. We, have, uh, we have also the Réseau Maritime de, of uh, Réseau, Quebec. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a stand there. But even there, data sharing can be complicated. And you know, maybe, maybe we have to follow the, the trends. There's so much smart technologies these days. Maybe we can all use of the, this opportunity to to, to favor the data sharing and become some kind, not smart cities, but smart blue city, thing like this. I don't know. Great, good point. So it's kind of, it, as the time is running, I would like to maybe push a little bit forward uh, about what do you think, um, what do we need to succeed in a sustainable development of Arctic and North. So you, you talk, uh, we talk a little bit about data sharing and then networking and uh, working with uh, research. So do you have other points that you think that it's really important uh, for the audience to know to, uh, to better do business and development for those regions? I can talk a little bit both about education and training. <laughs> of course, we need that, but I can be, we can be more specific in terms of, you know, uh, we have we have to try to retain the brains there. Okay, that's easy to for for, for students to go outside of the uh, of the region and not coming back after. So we have to find a way to attract them, to give a, to show them the new income, the new possibility of revenue there and at the end the region if they are getting some interesting education and training and they can bring it back and train uh, and be involved in the primary school thing like this and show uh, all of this opportunity to the other younger so i think it is one uh, one very important thing that's a good point um well <laughs> what a question eh? um personally i think um well, you probably heard about what we call ecosystem-based ma based management. It's a concept that we're trying to implement in the southern ecosystems. I would say very difficult, if not impossible, to implement because we're living with our the way we, we've been doing things in the past. So it's very difficult to change this management structure that we've established over the 150 years ago. <laughs> Uh, but we do have an opportunity up in the new zones to come up with this new model. And I would say that's where the challenge is, is if, if we would have an opportunity to implement this ecosystem-based management approach where definitely you need science, you need industry, but you need local communities and partners. So if we're all part of the game, um, I think we can succeed and, and not repeat what happen in, in the southern yeah. parts. Uh, it's pretty unique. I mean, we're starting from scratch in, in some northern parts. So uh, let's do it, I would say, uh, the right track this time. Yeah, yeah well, I think, um, you know, we, we uh, our mandate is to bring products to market and help the ecosystem have commercial success. And uh, I'm thinking about all the great opportunities we can develop up north. I, I think we, uh, 
uh, there, there's, uh, there are all resources available to do that, uh, technology, capital. Uh, I think the education is at the heart of it. But eventually, there's going to have to be, uh, you know, uh, a buyer for, uh, let's say, an ingredient that is uh, being produced up north. And, um, and um, I was hearing in the last panel uh, over there, um, Naturex, saying that they have a great interest now in, you know, to get more involved in the biomarine uh, extracts and biomolecules, etc. And uh, from my experience, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of multinationals have, have scouting activities. Uh, for example, at INAF, we have, a, a, we have someone that uh, has the role to be Nestle Scout. Uh, on, our, on our organization, we have someone on our board from Cargill to act as scouting of innovations. And these organizations are there to early, in early phases, look at what's coming in the market. So my message and my point is to early not um, have the reflex to engage with these corporations uh, early and let them know what's going on and, and get them interested because they, they are really interested and they're pretty, pretty accessible too. And, uh, you know, sometimes they'll hear about something new and it's going to be a trigger and they'll get interested and down the road that's going to be the buyer for that new molecule that's being extracted up north. So I think we, ha we need to get them uh, engaged. I think there might be an image that they're less accessible uh, as, as they have a, an image of, of, of multinationals, but, but they really are and they do have scouting activities to do that. Uh, so I, I think even if, if it's in, in the north, let's, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the reflex that, uh, that I think uh, young companies and communities should have. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about a young company in Alaska. Or is that uh, a note at this somewhere? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, in, in Juno. Do, do you want a picture of that? <laughs> yeah, in Juno, uh, a company is called Tidal Vision. We have great Quebec examples, but let's just take this one because it's really, you know, up, up north in Alaska. In Juno, a small town, it's close to Whitehorse. And, you know, it, it's, it's pretty far, and they've developed a great product. It's called uh, Kaito Skin. So they, they're discussing with uh, clothing companies to have uh, clothes out of Kaito Zen that doesn't, that doesn't uh, take on the odor. Uh, because of the kytosin properties and it's biodegradable as well. I mean, if they do it over there, it's just a great example of, uh, you know, really a, it's a, a lot of opportunities are out there. Then there, there's even a VC fund for uh, First Nation communities that's uh, established. It's based in Quebec. They, they finance, uh, you know, local communities, First Nation business projects. So really, uh, you know, all the resources are there, but I think aligning them is, is really the... Uh, the, the challenge. That's why we're here, I guess, where it's a big step forward. I think what's important is that we have to keep the keys of the Nordic regions. Because, in fact, these regions are very exploited, which really give a lot of life to many people, and to countries, to foreign countries. But we have to develop the desire to keep the Nordic regions of the Nordic regions of the Nordic regions aux Québécois de, 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 de se développer dans le Nord et pas seulement dire à des, à des, à des grosses compagnies ou à des, des compagnies étrangères « Vous pouvez venir, puis vous développer, on en a besoin. » Non, c'est à nous de nous développer, puis éventuellement de vendre à l'international. Mais comme disait Yves aussi, il ne faut pas qu'on aille vendre nos, nos, nos produits bruts mais qu'on aille développer nous-mêmes les produits pour vendre des produits à haute valeur ajoutée. Et euh, c'est pour ça que nous-mêmes, on est une petite entreprise, on développe là-dedans, mais on a à cœur de le faire nous-mêmes, d'aller euh, euh, éventuellement après aller euh, euh, trouver les grosses compagnies puis euh, leur dire voilà quel produit on a, mais c'est à nous de le faire. Puis euh, pour une petite anecdote aussi, on a eu une très belle délégation euh, chinoise qui est venue l'année dernière, c'était très intéressant. Et on leur a présenté à Gaspésie, mais en leur disant, on est là, on va se développer, puis euh, on, on va vous tenir au courant éventuellement, mais on est là. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est important. <laughs> très bon point. Très I, think, I think also we're going to need some policies. Uh, for example, uh, there's opening up the Arctic may be very, very attractive to a lot of foreign countries, like, like she said. Uh, and obviously, we're going to have to establish some policies ahead of time. For example, Canada is now s signing some agreement with other countries to ban the use of large trawler fisheries in the Arctic until 
we have a better assessment of the status of the resource over there. So I think it's a precautionary approach just to avoid that we can destroy bef before even thinking of how we're going to exploit. So those kind of policies maybe will need to be set in place just to protect until we have a f fairly good knowledge of what we wish to do with the future uh, ecosystem over there. It's a good point, yes. Thank you for all of you. It's not finished. No. But no. I'll just keep a little piece of time for questions uh, from the audience if you like to ask some questions. So we have made an overview of uh, what are the key sectors and key resources, also the change and challenges of climate change. Uh, we uh, made a touch about uh, what are a little bit we talk about what are the advantage the advantage but also the limitations uh, to uh, work in northern and Arctic regions and also uh, what are your key um, advices for success in those regions so I would like to know if you have some question on other t other topics or do, if you want to go deeply in one of so the panel is yours. Yes, you can go to the microphone. For the very interesting uh, discussion, I wanted to ask you about shipping in the Arctic and mm -hmm. coexisting with uh, natural resources. Um, already this season, we've had quite a few transits uh, unaccompanied, some fairly um, dangerous loads. And based on the experience in Antarctica that I've seen firsthand, you know, within 10 years, there'll be some, some accident, some spill. So how do you see this uh, explosion of shipping uh, and perhaps a tourist industry coexisting with uh, exploiting some natural resources? I think it's for you, E. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can, I, I, I will push on your uh, answer that's, but after you. you. You pointed out the most urgent challenge, I'd say. Um, and one of the things uh, we're facing at the moment, the Arctic, if, if we talk about uh, surveys, uh, we have maps to navigate in the, in the Arctic, but those maps are a bit obsolete. Uh, so we're gonna have, it's, a, it's an open zone, basically. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no constraint uh, except ice. Um, so one of the big challenges we're gonna have to, to go through is uh, developing what we call corridors. We're going to need to think about where navigation should be, uh, what would be the constraint for navigating up in the Arctic, to make sure that, for example, uh, just take uh, marine traffic in whales. Okay? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, there's a lot of whales up in the Arctic, so we're going to have to define best corridors, navigation corridors, to minimize the impact on whales, for example. So we know, in we know what we have to cope with, what we have to deal with, um, and we're working towards that. In terms of uh, protecting and making sure that accidents and uh, security and safety, well, Canada just launched the, what we call the uh, Ocean Protection Plan, which is a mega program to ensure that once, once we develop the Arctic corridors, that we can as well protect it against uh, any accident or anything. So we have to really set in place a, a huge uh, infrastructure to make sure that if accident happen, and obviously it will happen, uh, that we can come very quickly. But that's, that's really the major challenge we're facing for the next 10 years. I was on the last week on the industrial uh, meeting uh, where uh, the shipping industry uh, here in Quebec was talking about it, it, it is not that easy to go there even if there is uh, less and less of ice uh, because you don't know uh, it will still stay a harsh environment uh, even if you have two or three or four uh, great winters you don't know when it will be the, the worst that and, and then it can be a nightmare so they are uh, pretty aware about that and they are not it I was a little bit surprised but it's it's really precautionous they they were aware about it and they are not they are I think um, in precaution uh, in precaution mode and watching what what 
will come, but they are not that ready, I think, for those people in Quebec to go up there and take the risk to, for the, the human resources on the ships and also for the environment, like you said, about spills. And so it's, but we have, we need to take time to, to think about it and do it properly. Another question from the audience? Maybe Catherine? No? <laughs> or a point of view from your part of the uh, North Shore? No? No? <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> well, I, I, don't have much to, I don't have much to say, but I, I uh, worked in the Arctic for many years as well with other communities, with the Gwich'in and Inu, Inuvialuit as well, and, and I totally agree. Like I think the Northwest Passage, like it's melting with the sea ice melting, but it's still a very dangerous way, so I think it will take time to really be in, prepared to do some massive, uh, uh, you know, production. However, like small uh, cases like Juno, or, or, or there are other occasions where people can be very creative. And there's, uh, and in Gaspésie, in the north shore of Quebec, is a bit the same situation. We are not in the Arctic, but we are remote. Yeah. So I think uh, it's the same thing, and we just have to to develop uh, some some links to the to the purchaser clients outside of, of Canada. And, and uh, we are there. We have amazing products. So I think there's a really good potential to, right. and we have to keep working for mm -hmm. us, but to develop the, the, the local communities and then the First Nations and also coastal communities as well. Good. Thank you. And our, maybe we have time. Not the, oh, yes, go. <laughs> Serge Gosselin from DFO, so is it a question My for... question is not for him. Yeah. No, I hope not. <laughs> but uh, we talk a lot about, you know, involving local communities, uh, Inuit. A lot of people have worked in the North and in the Arctic. It's quite important, and we all believe in that. Though, how to do it? And beside him, because he's part of the government of that, uh, from the you know, other point of view that you have, how can we, what would be the incentive? What, what would be appealing, you know, to say to Inuit community, we want to develop the North with you? And if we're receiving a no, for example, so don't touch it. So that might be part of the answer that we'll receive from them, you know, uh, this kind of thing. So we have to, to define how will be a best way, because I've worked also with the Inuit in the Arctic, and their point of view might be quite different, you know, than us in the South, as we mentioned, you know, not bringing the Southern way of doing things but the northern way of doing things, and that we might not be well used to that at this point. So maybe just, I don't want that to be a tricky question, but it's a real fact, you know, how will be they receive the fact that we want to develop the north with them? Will they agree or not? I think we have a brand new, a brand new panelist in the room, <laughs> <laughs> so I give you. <laughs> no. But, but I, I totally agree, but I think the First Nations community, uh, they, are, they want to govern their land. It's their traditional land. And I think if you want to develop the North, well, you have absolutely no other choice than go work with them and see if they can accept you as a partner. You cannot just go and say, hey, I'm going to do this and that. But they, they are uh, uh, entitled to, to that land since several generations and hundreds of years. So I think uh, and we can see it politically. Now the Canadian government is really backing this, this idea that there's a, the governance of the land. We go to the First Nation for the traditional lands and Inuit as well, especially in the north where there's less colonization. They really have much more power than smaller nations in, in the south. So I think that's certainly something that uh, has to be kept in mind. And I've seen the Mackenzie uh, gas project falling apart because there was no support from the Gwich'in and the Inuvialuit. And that was a huge project. And, 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 but because they didn't want development in their land and they wanted to protect the caribou more than the oil and gas, and they won their case. So that's wonderful. And, and I think, but if you can go and explode those small berries or do something that they have an advantage and they gain capacity from it, then you can go and, and sit equal to equal with them, but if you arrive and say, I have the money, I'm going to do, uh, I suggest this and that, of course, it's not going to work out. But, so. but you know, based on, on my experience, uh, I know that they don't like when we arrive with our, with our own ID, with our own vision. We must let them come with their own ID vision and then join our ID and vision to them. That's, I think, one of the best ways to, <clears throat> to work with them. I, I agree with you. I think it's all about respect yeah. and respecting their speed, their rhythm, uh, and you know they they need to control what they want to change and at which 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 speed. We have have other experience. I mean, when the First Nations got into the snow crab business, it took many years, 
and uh, they had some knowledge transfer, but great partners can respect their speed and they'll, they'll change eventually in their way, uh, but uh, it's a very good point. I think it's uh, definitely a subject. So it's a good question. Maybe only one last word because it's already finished. But from all of you four panelists, if you have to choose one word to uh, explain what you think about um, sustainable development of North and Arctic region, what is that word? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was not prepared. <laughs> I must say just one word, but uh, I think we, we really need to do it in an intelligent way and show to the world that Canada can develop the northern region in an intelligent way. Okay. I'm going to repeat what I said. I think it's an opportunity for what I call ecosystem-based management. It's something that we heard so much, but we have, we have somewhat failed in our region, in our zones. Um, Probably the best way to, to develop the North would be to take advantage of this concept, uh, which calls for um, participation from, from communities. I mean, we, have, we do need the respect of, of these communities to apply this system. <clears throat> Probably going to say, uh, you know, ecosystem, is that one word? Or because there's a knife in there? Or, but uh, ecosystem, I think everybody has to pull in the same direction. Uh, we, uh, our organization, we went down to Silicon Valley and we looked at what are the pieces of a successful ecosystem, you know. Uh, we have benchmarks all over the place, right? Uh, we have to have a lot of organizations and companies in the same pool. And so ecosystem, I think, is a fluid ecosystem. But, uh, Thank you. And okay. finally? Uh, two words, local brains. We must focus on the training okay. of the local brains, you know. By, by example, today we have two uh, local uh, master student from, from university that, uh, that are from the lower uh, north shore of Quebec. Please, guys, Jessica and Carla, you can stand up. No, stand up, stand up. I, I want, you know, those girls are making master study and um, they, are, they are biologists, environmental science, and we ask them to understand very advanced chemical chemistry technique, you know. I don't know how they are doing, but, they, but you know, they, they know that they can make more than, for example, they are working with wild berries, they are making pies, as we can see, but they know that we can do more than that. Okay, so they are teaching uh, all the other young people there, so, no, no, so, and they are very courageous, brave girls, so maybe we can just, you know, yeah. Yeah, encourage them, <laughs> and they want to come back, and they want to come back, and they're, and they're already not sure of Quebec, so I think they are a very good model. Thank 